long time. It's fun to play. Uh, I don't know how long it could go, but anyway, <laughs> it's um, from the Modes Book Two. He wrote two um, books of pieces in the Modes, and uh, this is what this is called: Each Moment, the Wild River. suggested that if anybody is willing and able to perhaps move a little closer to the front, uh, that that might even be ideal. Um, past that, if you didn't get a hand up, please let me know. I have extras over there. Uh, and joining us today is Dr. K. Is it Zavislav? Zavislav. Zavislav. Uh, who is a professor of piano pedagogy or piano performance or just piano in general? Piano and keyboard skills. Okay, yeah. piano and keyboard skills at Western Washington University. Uh, in addition to that, she's a renowned performer, uh, recitalist in the area and abroad, uh, and she plays with Dr. Jensina Oliver in Duo Cascadia, um, which I believe they have a performance upcoming, uh, which perhaps if we're lucky she'll even tell us about. But today she's going to be sharing uh, some of her thoughts on when is it okay to steal a, a little bit of a conversation about the body. Um, so without further ado, okay, please. All right. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us, having me here. Um, so I, I have 
horrible short-term memory. So I just have to check off my to-do list mentally, like right away. So since uh, Ryan mentioned about the performance, um, Jensina and I are playing a recital at uh, Green River College on, in Auburn on Sunday at 2 p.m. It's free. So if you're in the area or you don't live too far from, from uh, Green River College, please consider joining. Um, okay, uh, besides that, so today's topic is on rubato. And um, some years ago, uh, a member here, one of the members invited me to present in a national conference and the theme that year for the Pedagogy Saturday was um, about the artistry, how to encourage students to play artistic. So that's, that's kind of like, I'm actually continuing with the theme just for my own teaching. And, um, you know, I have a lot of students that they are quite diligent. They can play notes and with great accuracy, great dexterity, good memory, but what's beyond that? How do they create or how can we encourage them to play with you know, more passion or emotion or more stylistic um, features? Um, so what do we do? So, um, and then that's kind of uh, the baseline of this presentation about rubato. So over a number of years of teaching, just like others, my teaching evolves and focus on various aspects of interpreting piano works. I have lived through different trends in my own teaching, a phase contemplating on voicing, or a phase strengthening counting and rhythm, a phase pondering on fingering, or a phase absorbed by a certain composer. The list goes on. A few years ago, I was teaching one of my adult students in a lesson. And I caught myself attempting quite hard to explain how to make decisions on the pacing. In other words, how to employ the concept of rubato. So that her playing would have more nuance and expressive quality. This is something that I do intuitively, and I bet many of us do that intuitively, especially after my teenage years, so I have not given much thought about verbalizing the step-by-step -step process. Naturally, I have suggested students in the past about where to take time and when to slight, slightly accelerate. But uh, something that I always have to remind myself is that I would like to teach students how to catch fish rather than just give them fish. So that's kind of my philosophy. And um, this is not a really good business policy. You know, good business policy is for somebody to keep coming back to you until, you know, the end of life. <laughs> that's, the, that's the good business policy, I think. You know, if you purchase like an Apple product and you're hooked forever <laughs> with the Apple adapter and the Apple computer and Apple devices. But, I, I think I'm a horrible business person because I actually want my students to become as independent as possible to teach them means on how to think about different aspects of music so that once they don't have me as teacher, they still have, um, they have practiced the, the thinking process to uh, make their own interpretation. So that's kind of one of my ultimate goals. So the realization came that there can be general concepts that could be explained and followed. Like any other concepts, once a person understands and repeats it, it can become per second nature. I hope the following discussion gives some insight as a starting point in encouraging each student's interpretation in the area of pacing and time. So rubato, a simple definition is in your handout, stolen, of tempo extended beyond the time mathematically available, that's slow down, stretch, or broaden. So that's coming from the uh, Grove Concise Encyclopedia of Music. So the background, so how do we figure out the formula? Formula, when to take time or when to accelerate, like 
how, how do we do that? So there's uh, several resources definitely that you can look into, but this handout is basically, I did the reading for you, so, <laughs> so I tried to condense to, you know, not like a 400 page book, but then to, you know, like three page handout. So um, one of the uh, favorite resources, this uh, we call it essay by C.P. Bach. Um, okay, so you will see some underline and it's completely up to you. The uh, students at Western, I always have to ask them like, oh, do you have pencil? <laughs> do you have pencil in your backpack? And then they, you know, panickingly uh, rummage through their bag. So if, if you feel like taking notes, you know, feel free to. Uh, I designated some spaces in your handout. So from C.P. Bach, um, certain notes, and so bullet point number one, certain notes and rests should be extended beyond their written length for affected reasons. They are indicated by a small cross. Okay, actually when you flip the page, and then there's an example. So CP has lots of ideas, but do you see example number one? I think this is like a few pages behind. Do you see this mysterious crosses? Mm -hmm. So he's just trying to uh, highlight in what kind of circumstances that you know you might be able to take time. I I actually think the um, the example on the second system, you know, you can see. Da -da -da -di -da 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 so the the first uh, the downbeat and then the second beat you know, to uh, kind of lean into that note. I think that that kind of pattern is uh, really typical. I think the first measure is a little more mysterious, but he puts X's on like, you know, like some accidentals and then the two note slurs. So there's just like some hint there. I, I'm not saying that this is like the conclusive thing, but some, some ideas pointing towards what we can do about the, some patterns. Now, um, bullet point number two. In slow or moderate tempos, kaizura or the phrase division are usually extended beyond their normal length, especially when the length of the rests and notes in the bass are the same as those in other parts. So then uh, my summary would be like, between phrases, take time. That's the summary. Bullet point number three. In general, the retard fits slow or more moderate tempo better than very fast ones. So he's saying that the rubato is more possible in moderate or slower pieces rather than fast pieces. Um, in affetuoso playing, the performer must avoid frequent and excessive retards, which tend to make the tempo drag. So then, He's already telling us that we should have some reasons how, why we want to take time here or why we are accelerating here. He's actually discouraging just doing everything um, intuitively because if we do intuitively, then we have a danger of dragging everything. So he's trying to kind of uh, steer us to think you know, think about certain conditions that uh, we might um, observe, so then we employ this concept of rubato. So CP is like giving us the warning that, yeah, the dragging is bad, the effect, you know, the feeling of the slower or moderate piece itself readily leads to this fault. Hence, every effort must be made despite the beauty of detail to keep the tempo at the end of a piece exactly the same as the beginning. <laughs> An extremely difficult assignment. And I must agree with him. You know, I adjudicate uh, quite, quite a bit in the area and students playing, you know, various pieces and somehow the beginning of the piece and then the end, end of the piece is a different tempo. And I have heard this more often than you can ever imagine. 
And I do kind of an exercise. I ask them to jump around to different measure or jump around to different section to it with you know my um, uh, uh, very authoritative like <laughs> clapping and then uh, to check the tempo. Do you realize you go too fast here, too slow there? So you know. Um, hundreds of years ago, CPE already realized that that is a problem. And um, in our modern days, the, um, the issue is still ongoing. Um, okay, next bullet point by CPE, passes in a piece in the major mode, which are repeated in the minor, may be broadened somewhat on their repetition in order to heighten the effect. So I like this statement because I actually kind of sometimes do this intuitively. But then now the master is telling, giving us the permission to do this. But remember the beginning and ending need to be same speed. So if you slow down in the middle, you need to get back to the original speed. But this is possible to make it artistic and emotional. The next bullet point, on entering fermata, expressive of languidness, uh, tenderness or sadness, it is customary to broaden slightly. So approaching the fermata, you can slow down a little bit. Um, the next one is another my favorite. A noteworthy rule, which is not without foundation, is that all tones of a melody which lie outside of the key may well be emphasized. So simply my summary is accidentals. If you see accidentals, they, there's a potential to emphasize them. How do you emphasize? Or, of course you can play louder or play softer, but you might linger into it. So that's something that I do all the time. I'm always like on the hunt for accidentals. So CP su also suggests that the left hand accompaniment should keep steady and right hand melody sings freely. The coordination is challenging. So this, you may perhaps heard this, you know, the left hand needs to be steady and right hand sings freely. So where, where is this concept coming from? Well, he's one of the earlier ones to talk about this. Now, so those are the kind of uh, quotes from the CP box essay. Also, another reference that I use often is um, the, the references at the, at the end. The Performance Practices in Classic Piano Music by Sandra Rosenblum. Um, this book is so thorough. She spent more than 10 years to write this book. And in fact, I had a pleasure of meeting her through Zoom. That was actually a scary situation. I gave a presentation and Sandra Rosenblum was in the audience. <laughs> Good thing I only discovered after the presentation. It was a Zoom presentation, but I, I had a, a lovely visit with her. Um, so uh, Rosenblum summarized that about the CP's idea that note values and rest must be observed strictly However, certain purposeful violation of the beat are often exceptionally beautiful. Both notes and rests are occasionally held longer than their notation required for reasons for the affect. In general, this expression is more appropriate in slow or moderate uh, tempo than very fast ones. So that's kind of the summary of the CPE's ideas. Um, okay, let's see. Now, the next uh, writer about, you know, piano playing is Turk, and he has a section about ritardando and accelerando. So this is uh, taken from Clavier Schuet, so it's like school of piano, uh, 1789. So the next ideas are by Mr. Turk about retardado and accelerando. So the first bullet point is, um, we have to identify the situations in which discretionary addition of an accelerando or retardando by the performer was considered appropriate. Okay, so when, when can we do this? 
in a piece whose character is intense, angry, or uh, present, represent wrath, fury, and the like, one can play the most forceful passages somewhat more quickly. So students tend to rush something that's really exciting and fast. Maybe it's not all bad. <laughs> Maybe it's actually bringing out the character. But then students also need to have a control over it. You know, it, it cannot be just automatically any passage accelerating. But knowing the character, and then that's our job to investigate the character of the certain section of the piece. So and if student feels you know, inclined to go a little bit quicker, maybe that's okay. We actually have per permission to do that. Similarly, individual ideas that are repeated more intensely, usually at the higher pitch, require that one also increases the speed to some, some extent. At times when gentle feelings are interrupted by a lively passage, the passage can be played somewhat hurriedly. Hasting is also permitted in idea in which unexpectedly a more passionate affect should be aroused. So, you know, um, the example that I didn't write in here, but it just popped into my mind right now is Wallstein Sonata by, by Beethoven. You know, some teachers will demand students to play the first, you know, um, maybe you have heard this piece. happy to read things like this. Um, okay, now, but then you have to go back to the original tempo at some point. That, that's kind of an important concept. In exceptionally tender, languishing or melancholy passages in which the emotion is as if brought to a peak, peak is the, the key word here, the effect can be greatly strengthened by an increasing hesitation, so which is a retardando. So the peak in the slower, more tender piece, maybe you can take time. Now, uh, likewise, in the approach to certain firmatas, here, here he goes. Exactly same concept as C.P. Bach. C.P. said, approaching firmata, take little time. Mr. Turk said, approaching firmata, take a little time. So there's some uh, familiar concepts here. <clears throat> now, uh, Mr. Turk says, slowing of the tempo is appropriate in written out ornamentation and transitions notated in small notes. Have you played something by Chopin? Does he have those notes, series of 20, 27 notes, <laughs> 11 notes. So, return now ornamentation and transitions notated in small notes. Do they qualify to match this? Maybe. Also, there's, uh, Mr. Turk said, the slowing of the tempo is appropriate in where it's marked espressivo. Did you think espressivo is that a ticket to taking time? In my mind, maybe, but he said that's allowable. So two questions that we can ask ourselves from Mr. Turk. What are the more important notes to be lengthened and how long can one hold them? So this goes back to the idea of peak, right? The peak note, important note. 
can we, um, uh, that's the important note, can we lengthen it? Can we sit on it a little bit? Some other uh, thoughts, accented dissonances, and those distinguished by their high pitch. So another means of accentuation that is used more seldom and with great care, that, that, that the speaker not only places more emphasis on the more important syllables and the like, but he also lingers somewhat on them. Now, um, I would like you to keep in mind about this reference to language. I use this all the time when I adjudicate. Sometimes, you know, the sophisticated musical concepts might not be understood quickly, especially in like a map situation that you try to say something to young students. But if you change the context, use the example how you might speak, how you might take little quick breaths between sentences, you know, make a reference to the uh, spoken or written language, then students might understand the concept. Now, um, moving on, let's see. So to reiterate that um, in, uh, in tenderly moving passage between two lively, fiery ideas can be played somewhat hesitatingly. So again, he's going back to, you know, this tender thing, a little bit slower, but then when the lively passage or lively section comes up, maybe you can play that hurriedly. But then you need to go back to the original tempo. But then this is possible in composition in which two characters of contrasting types are presented. And the tempo change is not gradual, but then it's actually more abrupt. So as soon as the the uh, energetic or lively passage kicks in, you play a little bit quicker, and then the tender feeling comes back, go back. So without, you know, like bridging using retardando or atrelando, but changing the tempo slightly according to the character is possible. So now, some sayings from Mozart, so this is also quoted from uh, Rosenblum book. So Mozart said that, Everyone is amazed that I can always keep strict time. When these people cannot grasp is that in tempo rubato, in an adagio, the left hand should go on playing in strict time. Sounds familiar. With them, the left hand always follows suit. So that's something that Mozart said to uh, people he knew. And some interesting uh, example, if you would go to, let's see. so this is example four. So if you can look at example number four. Um, so Mozart is, we all know that he was master of improvisation. Yeah. And when he repeats something, of course he can embellish or add different patterns to make it interesting. Maybe it's possible to suspect that he, he made the passage more emotional by potentially adding a little bit of rubato. And I think this example is really interesting because I never saw this as a example of rubato until I read the, this uh, chapter of the book. So what uh, Rosenblum is trying to highlight here is the main theme of the piece <laughs>
dislocation, oh, shoulder, no. <laughs> dislocation of right hand and left hand. Guess what? Actually, Mozart has the example of this, you know, dislocation, expressive, expressively playing hands at a different time. And this was really interesting to me to, to witness this, you know, to make something more, more emotional and to, to do something, you know, tweak the timing of things. He didn't change anything. He didn't change notes. He just simply changed the little timing to make it more emotional. But then, as Mr. Mozart said, okay, left hand has to keep going. Left hand is the time manager. Yeah, you have to listen to your manager so that you stick with the, your appointments and schedules. Okay, <clears throat> so that was Mozart. Now, moving on to Beethoven. Of course, this is my presentation, so I pack everything with all the quotes that I love, right? <laughs> so Beethoven also quoted from Rosenblum's book. Beethoven left no evidence that he used the term rubato, but he made clear reference to its practice in his later work with the inscription on the song. So this is north or south. So this is a song. Uh, in 1817, where he wrote that the metronome indication was appli applicable only the first measure, <laughs> for feeling also has its tempo. So how do you feel about this statement? <laughs> do you know why I love this statement? And every Beethoven sonata I play, I, I totally apply this. <laughs> And I just make sure the beginning and ending are at the same tempo, yeah? Beethoven's orchestra conducting, described by Ignaz uh, von Siegfried, detailed his exactness with respect to expression, not exactness with respect to metronome marking, exactness with respect to expression, including an effective tempo rubato. So his conducting was characterized by that. So then, I love this quote because I strongly believe to understand the character or the context, that's like the pinnacle of what I want to do with my own playing. Everything else, tempo, articulation, pedaling, everything else is subordinate to support you know, to bring out the essence, bring out the character, bring out the emotional feeling um, that peace is trying to stir in us. So, so that, that's how I see it. Rather than, you know, okay, the metronome marking, this has to go until the end, articulation, pedal, everything has to be done. Of course, I want to be as truthful as possible to the score, but what, what, what do we do with music making? We want to feel emotional. We want to be stirred up. Isn't that the, the underlining desire that we, we have? <clears throat> so um, I agree with Beethoven's statement. Czerny, just a little idea, advocating for mostly consistent tempo with minimum alteration. However, very subtle tempo fluctuation may be possible to enhance the character of the section or a passage if it's perceived as moving in one tempo. Do you, uh, any of you use the Czerny etudes? I know you do. <laughs> yeah? So Czerny equals mechanical. That's kind of the idea that many people might have. But 90% of my students have to do Czerny. And I actually make them play every etude as emotionally or as expressively as possible. And I really enjoy doing that because, you know, the harmony is simple, patterns are repetitive. So it's definitely less complicated than like Chopin Ballad or Rachmaninoff Concerto. The, you know, four line Czerny etude is compact, much more accessible. So that, this is when we should actually really learn how to do the expressive things, when our 
mind or the student's minds are not completely occupied by the fingering and notes. Yeah, so actually using Cherny to practice how to think about the expression, how to think about the character is actually really effective, I, I find. That's just my, my opinion. It's very subjective here. Okay, now, <clears throat> some ideas from Chopin. Okay, I have to speak quicker. That's bad. Okay, some ideas from Chopin. First bullet point, long note is stronger, as is also a high note. A dissonant is likewise stronger, and equally so a syncopated note. Okay, so those are the four kinds of notes that we should play stronger. The ending of a phrase before a comma or a stop is always weak. So this is, okay, taper, tape, uh, taper off this phrase. Now, one of the most important ideas from Chopin is that Chopin insisted above all on the importance of correct phrasing. So that's, the phrasing is really important. All the theory of the style which Chopin taught to his pupils rested on this analogy between music and language. So here we go. And again, the reference by another composer, another master composer, about the music and language. On the necessity of separating the various phrases, on the necessity for pointing and for modifying the power of the voice, and its rapidity of articula articulation. Here follow some principal rules for musical punctuation and elocution. <coughs> okay, um, let's see. So Chopin feels that eight bar phrase, that's kind of a typical length. The end of the eight bar, there it goes period. But within the eight bar phrase, maybe after four bar, there could be a comma. So he's, he connects you know, what he wrote with how you know, grammatically like we organize our language. So he's making a strong reference to that. He advised his pupils not to fragment the musical idea, but rather to carry it to the listener in one long breath secret of how to express breathing at every point where a singer would take a breath the accomplished pianist should take care to raise the wrist so as to let it fall again on the singing tone with the greatest suppleness imaginable so if any of your student had adjudication with me this wrist goes up at the end of the phrase, wrist goes down at the beginning of the phrase. I didn't make that up. Who said it? Chopin said it. The wrist, according to Chopin, respiration in the voice. So we will remember about that. Okay, some ideas on rubato by Mr. Chopin. Chopin required adherence to the strictest rhythm, hated all lingering and dragging, misplaced rubatos, as well as exaggerated retardando. So what do you think he might think if I play the E flat nocturne like that? <laughs> I don't think he'll be happy. Continuing with Chopin's rubato, the hand responsible for the accompaniment would keep strict time. Have we heard this? We heard this like multiple times already. While the other hand singing the melody would free to free the essence of the musical thought from all rhythmic fetters, either by lingering hesitantly or by eagerly anticipating the movement with a certain impatient vehemence um, akin to passionate speech. Rubato is a nuance of movement involving anticipation and delay, anxiety and indolence. Okay, now this is an interesting statement. A piece lasts for say five minutes. 
only in that it occupies the time for its overall performance. Internal details of a pace within the piece are another matter. And there you have rubato. Somehow I feel a little bit of kind of a common commonality between, you know, like start the piece in one tempo and end the piece in another tempo. This is a little bit different viewpoint on it, but if the piece is supposed to take five minutes, okay, you can do things within the allowable five, five minutes, but five minutes doesn't have to be divided exactly into 100 measure of this piece. It doesn't have to be like that. Maybe you have heard this quote uh, by Liszt on Chopin's playing. Look at these trees, the wind plays in the leaves, stirs up life among them. That tree remains the same. That is Chopinesque rubato. And I think it's a beautiful vision about that. Now, um, Liszt's playing, Liszt's approach to rubato is a little bit different. Now there's a new, new word um, thus far, agogic rubato became part of the romantic expressivity and showmanship of the traveling virtuosos of the 19th century, among whom, whom Liszt was apparently the most remarkable pianist. The extent of his rubato can be gauged not only by the frequent, frequency with which he wrote such directions as ritardando, acerlando, stringendo, and espressivo in his music. No doubt he played with more flexibility than he indicated. And by the many descriptions of his playing and teaching. Now, if you look at uh, example, I can tell you which number. Okay, please look at example number 12. Do you see a line over the right hand and then followed by this rectangle, like interrupted rectangle? Mm -hmm. So Liszt actually wrote, he, he created the indication for rubato. So the simple single line means rallentando and then the rectangle one is acerlando. Mm -hmm. So besides he, you know, he put like agitato or uh, you know, rallentando, he used the words, but he also used symbols to, uh, you know, tell students this is where you, you're going to slow down, this is where you're going to accelerate. And do you see that there's almost nowhere that you're supposed to play in strict tempo? This is, this is kind of crazy in my mind. It's, it's uh, very intriguing to me. So you have some idea about uh, list. Now, um, some idea about Brahms. Okay, I have found some contradicting ideas. So some resource said that Brahms treated tempo with more restraint, but he also applied some agogic rubato when performing. But then at the same time, I found a resource that Brahms is uh, on, on uh, that was by somebody who took lessons from Brahms on Brahms's playing is that his playing was very elastic and expansive and plenty of space between phrases. And then also in Brahms's music, you see the hairpin looking like that on one note. So what do you do with that? That's a question. That's actually calling for rubato to linger into that, that note. How can we increase the volume and decrease the volume when you play one note. That's not possible unless somebody um, invents new kind of piano. So actually his music calls for quite a bit of rubato. Now the summary on uh, you know, the, this 18th century tempo rubato, uh, the underlining con concept of tempo rubato held by 18th century musicians was redistribution of rhythmic value in a solo melody against an accompaniment that maintained a steady beat in a constant tempo. So there are two uh, umbrella terms for the type of rubato. One is called contrametric rubato. So 18th century, that was more common. The left hand accompaniment was steady. 
and then right hand sings more freely. So they don't need to match. 19th century rubato, the term rubato became identified with tempo flexibility and elasticity from a flexibility related to the effect of ritardando and accelerando to a greater or lesser degree. So these are called agogic rubato. So both hands will do the rubato slowing down or accelerating together. So there's like a difference between left hand keeps going, right hand free. That's a contrametric rubato. Both hands slowing down and accelerating together. That's considered a gajic rubato. And who are the composers use either one of the, uh, the rubato approach? Schubert, Mendelssohn, Chopin, maybe cl classicistic approach. So more of a contrametric rubato is possible. Liszt, Brahms, Clara Schumann, Robert Schumann, maybe more in the agogic rubato category. Now, um, there's this kind of a diamond set uh, types of rubato. So A is contrametric rubato, left hand is steady, melody is flexible. Now, um, do you have a little place for like a rest? in your handout. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's some ideas about the rest. So this is about rhetorical rest. So in 1763, the German music theorist Marburg wrote an extended description of the rhetorical rest based on the relationship widely accepted in the 18th century between the rhetoric of speech and that of music. In music, rhetorical rest occurs in the midst of a conversation or in the midst of a section to act as punctuation or because of the effect for both reasons. Okay, so we will have, I know that you have memorized everything I just kept talking. <laughs> so we will see some examples and I'm going to have you do a little guessing game. Okay, now... The next diamond is considerations and opportunities for rubato. Okay, so you have one key tempo mood, that's a consideration because the tender mood can go slower, lively mood can go a little quicker, right? The mood is important. Number two, modes. Okay, so major mode, minor mode can go a little bit slower. I said that earlier. Number three is phrasing. Brahms has lots of space between phrases. Chopin said phrase is the most important thing. You need to have a comma or a period before, between phrases. And how about uh, 3A is breaks, 3B peak within the phrase, 3C melodic leap. Maybe that's also possible to consider Peak, I think there's a gray area. Number four, rests. CP said to uh, extend beyond its notated length. Mr. Marburg said, what about rhetorical rest? Number five, do you remember CP's uh, point about the notes that doesn't belong within the key, accidentals? Number six, so number six is a little bit of my idea, harmonic progression. How about some unusual, interesting harmony, 6B harmonic rhythm, the increase or decrease of the harmonic rhythm? Or how about cadence? Cadence is, has a close tie with the phrasing, right? They, they cannot be separated. Now, number seven, dance type. What do we do in certain dance possibility? Okay, now, I would like to go to, jump to uh, example five. I, I organized the examples in chronological order, but maybe the, the topic is jumping around. So example five, do you see a Mozart example? Mm -hmm. Do you see a mysterious empty square in the fifth measure? Mm -hmm. So, what I would like you to do, if you don't mind, is to decide which type of opportunity 
that we have here. So we have A, contrametric rubato, B, agogic rubato, and then we have one key tempo mood, two modes, three present. Do you see the list? So then my idea is that you will insert one of the reasoning there. Because the exercise is that we do employ rubato, but we back with some historical concept or historical suggestion. That's what I want to do. And I'm sorry that um, I'm, I tried to speak quickly, but, um, but we, can, we can still do a few examples, I think. So this one, I'm trying to ease into this exercise because you just have one square there, right? So what's happening here? Should I play? Example 6a? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm missing empty squares. I need my cheat sheet. <laughs> okay, 6a. Oh, okay. So 6a, the mysterious square, is in the fourth measure.
Now, I'm sorry to go in really quickly, but example 6C. What's happening here? This is a little more difficult.
we already did the uh, list and then the morning greeting. Another, you know, this is teaching piece, simple piece, but look how many squares I have. Those squares are the opportunity to think about the rubato. Okay, so looking at the last page, example 14. So this is very, very interesting example. example. So do you see right off the bat on the beat one, you see hurricanes? Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Do we do one, one, one and two and one? So just uh, for 